Now, if you want to look at some creativity, just look behind me. Is that not the most beautiful thing you have ever seen? And the, the shadows up above the flowers. I just love that. Nick, thank you so much. What a blessing. So good morning to my friends here. I'm so happy to be here on this beautiful soft day, as the Irish say. I think that fall is in the air, and I am personally so grateful. It has been quite a blazing summer in the city. So I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you today a little bit about our theme for the month, creativity. We're going to start off with a little inspiration from the Daily Word, which is Unity's daily devotional. And it starts with a great affirmation for creativity. Divine creativity is alive in me. Would you say that with me? Divine creativity is alive in me. Amen. Thank you for that. So the text reads, it's easy to appreciate the amount of creativity it takes to produce a work of art, but that level of inspiration is also available to me as I plan my day. I am innately creative. From what I will eat to planning what I'm going to accomplish, I embrace it all as an exercise in using my imagination to consciously create my life. I look for new ways to express my unique abilities. Maybe I'll expand my vocabulary by writing a note to someone who inspires me. I might explore the culinary arts and create a new menu that celebrates health and wholeness. I could even learn to paint. But whatever I do, I claim the power of divine creativity as my own to make the world a better place. You know, I'm always so grateful of the wonderful topics that you folks decide on and give to your speakers here. And thanks to retirement and this lovely warm summer, I've had time to really explore and enjoy the cultural wealth and creativity of the city, and a lot of it amazingly for free. I made it down to the opera movies a couple of times at Lincoln Center just a few weeks ago. I saw the hilarious old Marx Brothers movie, Night at the Opera finished up by uh, Puccini's beautiful Madame Butterfly. I went to see uh, Norman Rockwell's wonderful paintings, the four, uh, the four Freedoms, that's displayed with a collection of his other paintings from 1942 that all helped promote the war bond effort in America. I saw Harry Houdini's very scary straight jacket and I rode the Staten Island Ferry just to say hello to Lady Liberty and the Freedom Tower. And I felt inspired and energized by each one of those experiences and the creativity that made each of those things possible. I realized that those opportunities had literally fed my soul, my consciousness, and reminded me that spirit was present in each one. Creativity is the energy that allows us to transform our daily lives and honor our connection to God. Unity sage Eric Butterworth calls the creative person a fully functioning person, someone in tune with the inner rhythms of our nature and in the flow of divine guidance and life, in wholeness, in perfect unification and expression of man as spirit, soul, and body. Now, earlier this summer, I saw a terrific documentary entitled McQueen. Anybody see that? Oh, it is such a powerful film, and it's about the brilliant and sadly short career of fashion designer Lee Alexander McQueen. Now, back in 2011, I attended a show called <coughs> Savage Beauty at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was an exhibit of Mr. McQueen's work and it broke all the lifetime attendance records here at the Met and at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London as well. I remember I stood for two hours and waited to get in, but as much as I grumbled, I walked away stunned and transformed by the exhibit. In the film, I was struck again by the genius and the creativity that erupted from Alexander McQueen. Equal parts of technical perfection, joy and darkness, passion, and I was so grateful for him and for the many people in his life who guided and encouraged him and recognized the fact that his talent was unique and could not be ignored. 
If you don't know McQueen's work, take a look at it when you get home on Google. I think of him as a comet or more like an asteroid of creativity, burning brilliantly for a short time and then flaming out. For sadly, Alexander McQueen died by suicide in 2010. It reminded me that over the last several years, we've seen a number of high-profile creatives, well-known celebrities such as Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain, and the unforgettable Robin Williams, who lost their individual battles with depression and anxiety. And I wondered if there was a link, perhaps, a crossroads in the midst of that huge blessing of spirit-inspired creativity, where its potential and its burden of responsibility seem to overpower some individuals and not others. Now, creativity, it's said, is an essential part of a successful and fulfilling life. Yet despite its importance, we often misunderstand it, and a lot of us still don't understand how to motivate it and to use it to our advantage. Well, renowned psychotherapist Dr. Rollo May did some really amazing research on this, and I'd like to share a bit of it with you this morning. Dr. May believed that anxiety and self-doubt were unavoidable aspects of the creative process. He said that creativity starts with a vision of something to create when that's formed in our imagination. And the vision as we see it is ideal, it's perfect and without a flaw. Now in unity and in new thought, that stands to reason because we know that ideas that we have come from divine mind, from the mind of God, from spirit and they are inherently whole and perfect. Think of a moment when you had a great idea to create something, a garden, a painting, a book, a business. You probably imagined the final product and experienced a series of feelings of motivation and excitement, promising yourself you were gonna fulfill your vision and see the project through to the end. But once that euphoria fades away, Self-doubt can creep in. The self-doubt is a normal part of the creative process. The result of the realization that no matter how hard we try, we just might not be able to reach that vision of perfection that we first imagined. Creati creativity requires courage. That ability to do something that scares us not to be without fear, but with the capacity to move ahead in spite of fear. Creativity requires a component of chaos. And now some of us could choose that madness or dysfunction, but I like to think of chaos in a more metaphysical way, as referred to in Genesis as that darkness before creation, that place without form and void, the place of expectation. Creativity requires a bit of destruction, perhaps, the tearing down of old, limited thinking, our natural tendency to want to play it small or hide our light under a bushel. But here's our chance to break the old model, the old tried and true way of doing things. Here in the time before the birth of our great ideas, we must trust that the inspirations are from spirit and there's nothing to fear in bringing them forward. But the ultimate point of creativity is that it empowers our self-actualization. And that's a great big old word for our need for personal growth and development throughout our life to reach our full potential. Spiritually, this means coming into oneself, evolving into a knowing and understanding of our wholeness of our unification of mind, body, and spirit. And here's the kicker. The creative process, although touched with, spirit, with periods of self-doubt and anxiety, is equally blessed with peak experiences, with joy and wholeness that transform our self and our worldview. Dr. May concludes that the creative process must be explored not as a product of illness, but as representing the highest degree of emotional health, an expression of people in the act of being who they were born to be. So how in the world do we embrace our own individual creativity and encourage it and grow in this process? 
Well, research says that creative thinking involves making new connections between different parts of the brain. And that would suggest changing our thinking. Now that's a familiar term to all of us here this morning, changing our thinking. And by deliberately exposing ourselves to new experiences and learning opportunities, like the arts and culture and classes, Creativity can be acquired and increased at any age level or any level of experience. And here's another wonderful inspiration. We must take advantage of opportunities for creative collaboration. Coming together in groups to brainstorm, just like you do here in this community once a month when you meet to take positive action for this center. That old cliche, two heads are better than one, still holds true. Collaboration has its own special energy. One person says something and another person hears it through a different filter and changes it into a new context, giving it a whole new spin. Diverse minds, younger and older, coming into contact can spark unlimited positive ideas. Having supportive, equally creative individuals around us in partnership can help immeasurably in the total creative process. <coughs> in one of Eric Butterworth's lectures, he tells a charming story about a radio interview he heard with the famous American poet Robert Frost. The interviewer was asking Mr. Frost how he always seemed to maintain his optimism in his life, his positivity and happiness and creativity. So Mr. Frost replied, it seems to me that the important thing for creative and positive living is man's capacity to mold and shape things. I've decided that whatever I face the day, before I go down and listen to the radio or read the newspaper or even face my wife, I do two things before anything else. The first thing is I make up my bed. And the second thing is I make up my mind. The reason is that it's physical. It's something I can actually do, you know, straightening out the corners and smoothing the wrinkles out of the sheets and so on. But while I'm doing this, I get the feeling of identification with my mind. I'm making up my mind. I'm getting the wrinkles out of my mind. I'm getting myself organized and orderly. I'm beginning to think the kind of thoughts I want to think. I make the bed no matter what and then I make up my mind. Then I go down and face the world, and I'm secure that no matter what happens, I'll be on top of it. Mr. Butterworth then encourages his students to try it out in the coming week, and I encourage you to do so as well. Get up and make up your bed. And while you do, make up your mind, and that all of the creative intelligence in the whole universe is yours for the asking. Right now, and you can shape it and mold it however you want. And as you shape and mold your bed, you're shaping your mind into that positive and creative part and self-fulfilling energy of life. While he cautions that this exercise is not really a prayer, in a sense it may be more of a prayer than what we usually say, he suggests that we'll become more positive, more capable, and more ready to meet the day with positive creative energy. So as we draw our time together to an end, I want to give you one last thing to consider in this huge topic of creativity. While it seems that we're more frequently inspired by geniuses in the arts, it's reminded me that there are many circumstances where anyone can suddenly be offered the chance to, as the Daily Word said earlier, claim the power of divine creativity as our own to make the world a better place. With the 17th anniversary of 9-11 coming up on Tuesday, I immediately thought of the many forces and collaborative creativity that this tragedy sparked, evidenced in the hundreds of nonprofit charities that sprang up in the immediate aftermath. Well, as an old time fundraiser, it was good for me to learn that some of these charity foundations are still going strong 17 years later. For example, the Families of Freedom Scholarship Fund has raised over $100 million 
providing educational assistance to the children of those killed in the attacks. The amazing 9-11 memorial, which I just heard on the news this week, is currently the most visited institution in New York City. And I think it's one of the most powerful. If you haven't experienced it, please gather your courage and a friend and plan to do so. And last but not least, the Feel Good Fund, spelled F-E-A-L, named for a gentleman named John Feel, who lost his foot to amputation when a huge piece of steel fell down while he was working as a demolition supervisor at Ground Zero. He wasn't eligible to get help from the Victims' Compensation Fund, so he was inspired to start the Feel Good Fund to help support other first responders impacted mentally or physically during rescue, recovery, and cleanup of Ground Zero. As divine children of God, we are all born with limitless wealth of creativity, which when encouraged and opened out into the world, can make the world a truly better place. And so it is. Amen. Amen.